All right. I'm back. I did not make it back last night. I apologize. Um, when Grandpa comes over, granted, he's 97 years old. Going to be 98 this year. And um, he's over at my house telling me that we need to frame in the basement walls. So <laughs> when that happens, it's pretty hard to say no and uh, not drop what you're doing and help him out. So um, that's what, what happened yesterday. But we're going to get back into this uh, Sunfire Super Junior and finish this amp. So let's get to it. So uh, we left off uh, yesterday. We got uh, roughly... A third of it capped so we still have to work through this section here and down here um, I'm not sure if there are any failures um, I didn't even bother to power it up um, I wanted to recap it first before I even powered it up um, that gives me the best odds of not blowing anything else up if there is something wrong with it um, I hate replacing these output transistors they're kind of expensive so uh, I try to stick to uh, you know, the least destructive path of uh, restoration. So, let's get to it. Let's get everything powered up and heated up and uh, get this thing done. I don't usually get this early of a start in the morning, so we should be able to uh, work through this pretty pretty easily. My coffee has not kicked in yet. I like to stay up late and sleep in on Sundays. And for the record, this is not coffee. This is garbage. But I had one open, so I'm finishing it. Alright, we're at 500C. Still a little bit to go here. The heater in my solder sucker is definitely wearing out. thing used to get hot in seconds. Now it takes a couple minutes. But it still works. We could talk about this for a minute. Well, like, you know, you could tell Sunfire was trying to do the right thing. They used that rubberized silicone-based glue to hold their parts on. Um, they don't use thermal paste. They use thermal pads. I'm sure they, uh, you know, put a layer of uh, thermal protection by doubling up these devices. Like, they do. They put some time into this, and uh, you know, as I've said before, this is one of my favorite designs. It's it's easy to work on. The parts aren't buried underneath a bunch of glue. Um, really, the only downside to this, you know, entire amp, and well, actually, the the whole speaker. There, there's two things I don't like about the speaker. I don't like that they use cheap caps on the amp. Um, I understand they did that to keep the price down, but. I'm pretty sure these things were not cheap when they came out. So, I mean, the extra 40 bucks that they would have spent on quality caps probably would have made uh, a significant difference. Um, I mean, either way, you know, around 20 years are going to need to be replaced anyways. But still, I would have liked to see a, a higher quality cap in there. And the other thing I don't like about them are the, uh, the drivers on the woofer. And... Um, when I put this thing back together, I'll I'll talk about that a little bit. But they they don't use foam on the surrounds. They use like a thick rubber. And it, it's okay that they did that. But the problem is, is you can't find it anywhere to repair it once it goes bad. And rubber dry rots. You know, there's only a certain amount of life rubber has to it. So unless these things are like exquisitely maintained you're going to run into issues. And once they crack, um, you know, that's it. You're, you're done. People do use glue and try to glue them together. And, you know, sometimes that works, but it doesn't look good. And, you know, the driver usually needs to be rebuilt. And the only way to rebuild them, I found, is to use a foam surround. And I'm sure it alters the way that the sub sounds but you know it gets it back up and running and I, I actually have a uh, a blown driver that uh, I'm gonna rebuild in one of my videos 
it's not a, a terrible process. But it's hard to find the parts. I've only found one uh, one vendor online that sells anything that can be used. And I'm pretty sure he gets his parts from China. So they're either custom made or um, you know he got lucky and found a supplier. You know, he, he doesn't market them as uh, surround repairs for Sunfire subs. But I found that they are uh, about as close of a match as you can get. So... We'll do that. That'll be uh, in an upcoming, upcoming video. But we'll continue recapping this. Get this uh, back to some sort of usable state, and then we'll proceed from there. And the I got lucky when I got this one. The the uh, box was in really nice shape, and the driver is. Um, really good too which means that it was taken care of and somebody treated the rubber to keep it from uh, getting soft there's a whole bunch of different ways that people online say to do it I I generally just prefer to use armor all I don't know if that's the best way or the bad way but that's what I use and it seems to work and if nothing else at least it makes them look shiny Here's another one of those weird values, 0 0.047. Not 0 0.47, 0 0.047. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me double check. 0 0.4, so 0 0.47, sorry. So 0 0.47 and 0 0.68, those are the two weird low value caps that are in this amp. And the point sixty eight goes up on the top here, and the point forty seven is c thirty two Sunfire is the only amps so far that I've worked on that uses these low values, and every sunfire amp seems to have them. So the circuits are probably pretty close to identical in all of their uh, subwoofers from this era. Like the, I, I know that this driver circuit on this one is very similar to the MK2. It's just a lower powered version of it. I wish the MK2 was as easy to work on, but it is not. And I know I was, I'm always saying about not bending leads, but when you're reworking and replacing the caps, after they're soldered in, it's okay to bend them. Making, uh, we're making good progress here. We have most of the uh, the small caps done, and after that, it tends to go pretty quick. I don't like how this lead is bent right up by the cap, so I'm gonna adjust that. And it is sleeved in fiberglass, so you don't have to worry about. You know, giving it a little corrective push to move it where you want it. I like those tucked right up alongside the cap. Not that it matters, but it makes getting in here a little bit easier. And they're glued down, so it ain't going to go nowhere. Again, you know, double check, make sure that all of your negatives are pointing towards the power connector when you're working on this. It's just a quick sanity check. Um, I really like how they did that. I, I Actually, it, it seems like a decent amount of commercial designs tend to try and orient all the caps in the same direction. I, it, mu it must be for the machines that actually place them. 
makes life a little bit easier for those. But either way, I, I, I like that they uh, do it that way. I'm still working on getting a better video solution so I can zoom in and let everybody get a nice view of what I'm doing in here. I bought another uh, pan tilt and zoom camera. I just haven't had the time to hook it up. I'm thinking I can mount that on my sidewall. Get some close up shots. If I have some free time that'll that'll happen. Which generally means about six to eight months out. I definitely need to replace the filter in the solder sucker. It's not behaving. And if you were going to work on amps and uh, a lot of them, this, you know, having one of these powered solder suckers is almost a must. There is no way I would be able to do this without having that. I wouldn't want to. I, I started off doing it with manual solder suckers and wick and I just destroyed boards. The job was ten times harder than it needed to be because I didn't have one of those. Highly, highly recommended. If you're just doing this to your own sub and you have the, you have the patience to uh, do it right and, you know, not destroy your board, then you can probably get away with, you know, a, a manual one, especially on this amp. You know, if the leads are bent and you're trying to unsolder, you know, caps manually, you're better off just cutting them all out or breaking them off the board and then just pulling the legs out. It's uh, difficult to do. Not too bad with this, but difficult if uh, you don't have one of these. Especially with lead-free solder, and th these boards are lead-free, so that definitely sucks. We're, uh, I'd say we're three-quarters of the way done with this board. We're just doing uh, some of the little... I think these are filter caps for the power supply for some of the discrete devices. So yeah, for the for the uh, op amps and I don't know what that guy is down there. I think this is an opto isolator, maybe. Not sure. I'd have to look them all up. Luckily, that stuff just doesn't go bad, so you don't really have to worry about it. Some of these caps still want to fight you, though, even though they... ...do seem to be soldered while they... Lead free it just does not play nice. I have to cheat and put lead on both of these and then re pull them out. That happens. I acquired another Sunfire amp. You know, just what I needed another amp. But it's an MK2 where the uh, woofer actually destroyed itself. The basket broke and the magnet came down and smashed the board. And 
I'm going to restore it. It's going to be a fairly difficult repair, but, I mean, the board is completely wrecked, but I think I can do it, so that's going to probably be coming up in uh, a future video. And uh, as I said in the, the first part of this one, my, my goal is, you know, since I am trying to remodel my basement, the goal is to get the amp shelf completely empty. So I would say I probably have about 60 subs and amps to go through. So expect in the future, you know, plenty more videos. And they might be a little redundant, but, you know, as I've stated when I started out, I'm going to blog every single repair I do start to finish. You know, everyone is a little bit different, and... Uh, If I'm going to be doing it, why not have the camera rolling? It may not be uh, super entertaining to watch, but you know, each one might have a, a different problem that can help somebody else solve. So, I, th I think I'm uh, on number five or six for the uh, clips. R115 series subs. Uh, main Auto's back. How's it going, man? I I enjoy working on these Sunfire ones. They're they're uh, generally not too bad to do, and there's only you know a handful of people I think in the whole country that do them. I know um, on the Carver forums, Bill Flannery is, uh, you know, pr pretty much the god of these things, and uh, I believe he knew Bob Carver or worked there or something. So he's uh, like the main guru that works on these. I don't really know the guy. I never talked to him. It'd be kind of cool if he did pop in here and and you know told told us his story and said hi, but. Uh, from what I know, he has all the original information on these, and he is pretty much the best there is at repairing them. But as I said on the forums, I know he doesn't rewind Super Junior Transformers, so I might have him beat on at least one thing. Not that it's a competition, but that's my, uh, my little claim to fame that I have fun with. I agree. Um, you know, recapping on MK2. Uh, the MK2s are phenomenal subs. Um, I I don't know why they weren't more uh, more popular. Probably because the price tag on them was a lot higher. But the uh, I mean the MK2 is really just the bigger brother of the Super Junior. And uh, they, I mean they put out a tremendous amount of bass and and even for a, a 10 inch with a passive. Um, it's still pretty tight base. I mean, they have those huge thick surrounds. And they, they, they do a really good job. And I, I've always been a fan of, uh, the Klipsch RW series, and I've had those in my little mini theater for a while, and I like them, and they, they work great, but I got a whole whole bunch of Sunfires now, and I've decided that I'm going to keep two of those and 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 use them just because they put out an incredible amount of sound, especially for movie effects. And I'm more of a movie than a music guy, and they're great for music. But the, the ten inch Sunfires for movies are are hard to beat, especially if you have like really rapid action scenes because the uh, the thick rubber surrounds on those uh, drivers, you know, can really reproduce rapid, tight sound effects. So I'm going to try them out. And, you know, if it's too much, I can maybe go down to one. Or if I don't like it, I can always go to a different sub and, and sell them to somebody who will use them. So there's, I have nothing to lose. But I really do want to 
give those a go. And the the room is going to be fairly large that I'm putting them into. I think the uh I think the dimensions down here are 16 by 40, so it's going to be a, a, a decent sized room, so we should be able to fill them up pretty good with two of those. I don't know how I'm going to place them, maybe one in the front and one in the rear. I'm going to have to do a little experimenting to figure out what the best configuration is, but hard to hard to beat a Sunfire, I will say that. And I've I've uh I got a bunch of Veladines on the shelf. And um well, I'm going to go through those. The, the Digital Drive series, those are those are pretty good too, but I don't like that they use uh, closed loop control of the subwoofer. So they they have feedback, and nobody yet has figured out how to reverse engineer the feedback in the drivers. So if you have if the little accelerometer or whatever they use inside the woofer goes bad, the sub goes in the garbage. And Velodyne doesn't do audio equipment anymore, and they refuse to release their schematics or any of their design data. So, in my opinion, those guys suck. They might have made, you know, really high-end audio back in the day, but the fact that they moved on to different technologies and abandoned all their audio people, like, that doesn't sit very well with me. If you're getting out of, especially on, on an old design, you know, if you're not reproducing this technology anymore and you don't manufacture audio equipment anymore, why not release your, your design and your schematics so that people can repair and work on these things? And it's, uh, it's kind of upsetting. I, I made it one of my goals that I'm going to try and reverse engineer the feedback in the, uh, in the digital subs, but I mean, I don't know, you know, if I can and if I am able to, you know, will the parts still be available? That's the the problem. And I'm not like a a very big software guy. I mean, so I I don't know. I have some friends that could probably help me out, some people at work, but it's uh, it's probably going to be a fairly involved project. And it's going to involve a lot of measurements. Now, I do have a, a recording scope, so I, I can probably get some of that data, but I don't know. I, I'm not motivated to work on the Velodynes because I'm just not happy with them. This guy definitely had some leaking caps in here. Either that or it's really bad flux residue wash off. You can see all this crap down here. I don't know what it is. Hopefully it's not electrolyte. I'm definitely going to flux these caps up that are close to it just in case. It seems like flux residue, so we should be all right. I need to clean up my bench. My bench is destroyed. Mink oil. I'll have to. I'll have to try that for the rubber surrounds. I know there's a, a bunch of different like rubber protectant products out there. Um, I guess it'd, it'd be nice to know what the rubber was actually made out of. Are they natural rubber? Or are they synthetic? Because that that makes a difference too on what chemicals you should be using. But I've had good results with. Uh, Armor all. Armor all trim protectant seems to work pretty good. And it gives it kind of like an oily sheen to it, so it you can tell it uh, sticks to it. If nothing else, it'll protect uh, 
you know, any moisture from getting in or out. A little baby cap in here 47 and 16 volts it's another common cap on sunfires every sunfire has at least 147 microfarad cap I can't easily show you my little cap storage thing but yeah I have pretty much pretty much every value there is in the UPS series just because I, I've realized that if I'm missing one value and I work on something new, that's the value I'm going to need. It never fails. And I try to match the voltages. I, I know you can always go up in the voltage, but I'm kind of uh, OCD, I guess you would say, for keeping things authentic. So if it's shipped with 25 volts, I usually try to send it out with 25 volts, unless it's known to be a problem. Like if if there's a a known weak point, I I will up the the caps to something better. But I don't really know any weak points in these except for the Chinese caps that they use in them. Just for the heck of it, like since these are the ones that are usually bad, let's put them on the cap tester and see what happens. My cheap BM4070 cap tester, but I tell you what, this thing works pretty good. So this is supposed to be 220 at 35 volts. Let's see if we're still at 220. Yeah, that's 216, that's good enough. I'm not going to check them all, but usually these five larger caps are the ones that cause the problems on this board. What was the voltage on that guy? 35 volts. I don't know if I have a 35 volt and 220. At least not a fat 35. I have a skinny 35. The UPW series are the fat ones. And I think I used one of them, yeah, one of them up top over here. I'm going to check and see if I have any of those, just because I do have a lot of caps stashed in my spare boxes. I mean, it won't hurt to spread the leads out, but... It also doesn't hurt to check and see if I have the right one. So we're going to dig into the treasure box. I'm also going to check my shelf behind me, so bear with me if I make a bunch of noise. Yanking on the headphones here. Four seventy. I thought for sure I would have some of these because I usually try to keep the different sizes, but not always. I have one hundreds, more one hundreds. 220 at 25, 470, not for that amp, what's these, come on, 220 at 25, I think those are it, so yeah, you can see I've learned to, uh, keep stock of uh, various caps that I might need of different shapes and sizes. So I have the uh, little can ones and I hope that's 25 and not 35. It is, it's 35. That's no good. 
These are both 25 volt. Let's keep looking. Can't go down in voltage. That's no good. And it won't hurt to go to the taller ones. It just looks weird because they stand off the board a little bit. I'll check one more spot and then we're going to use the tall ones. Give me a second and we'll be right back. This is my like emergency cap bin that it just has random values in it. 220 at 25. And I'm just looking to see if I have the right size. It's not the end of the world, but I do like when they sit down flat on the board. And I'm going to add some to my cart either way to make sure that I'm stocked up for the next one. These are mostly UVZ series. Still pretty good caps, but um, not as long rated in the hours. I could go up to the 50 volts if I really wanted to, but I don't. I don't see it being necessary to do so. So I'm going to use the uh, this size, the UPS, and order some UPWs. So. Let's put this guy aside so I can make sure that I order some of those. And, it, you know, there, there's components on the board that stick up higher than that, so the height is not an issue. It'll be just fine. Not, not ideal, but just fine either way. It's still a better cap than what was in there by far. All right. Keep jamming away. Only a few more to go here. Sometimes these things will fight you. 10 microfarad at 100 volts. That's another Sunfire exclusive. But I make sure I keep those ready to rock as well. That and these large ones. These large ones are, I think, 47 at 200 or 250. Those are also Sunfire exclusives. Those are for the, the main power rails. The, the, the bus voltage on these is uh, plus or minus 160, I believe. It might be a little less on the Super Juniors. And these are still 250 volt rated. They're, they're pretty big caps. And I'm probably going to have to change tips in the solder sucker to get them. Oh, no, it fits. Lucky. Mm. 
Try not to burn yourself. This one does not look like it was leaking. I'll check another one just for the heck of it. This one could have been all power supply caps. Nope. Yeah, no, that's good. It's 47. It's reading 41, 42. That's a good cap. Let's see if we have some of these. I should. I have 47 to 200. I know I have these. If I don't, I'm going to throw a foot. Yeah, here we go. 47 at 250. No, I can't use the um, uh, UPS series for these because they're just too big. Like, that's monstrous compared to what we had. So these ones I use the UVY, uh, I believe. UVY. They're a little bit smaller, closer to the original size. The the uh, monster ones just wouldn't they wouldn't fit in the location and they would be too tall the sub would hit them. And these things are already like you know screaming tight inside the box. There's no room for any sort of uh, additional height. These larger pads, you know, make sure you walk the iron around the pad. Get the whole pad heated up. Definitely helps a little bit. All right, that is everything under the transistors. Now we got to do, let's see, I think we got, what, three more? Yeah, three more. Four more. Four more, and uh, then we move on to the power supply. That's the one we just did. All right, we're here. All right, four seventy and sixteen. That one had a little bit of crusty stuff on the bottom of it. I don't know what that is, but 470 at 16 volts. I thought I had some smaller ones of these. I'm going to check and see if I do or don't really fast. There's a Rubicon. Rubicon makes good caps too. I sometimes use those when when I have a oddball one that's like hard to find. Uh, the uh, Nichicon ones are the same diameter though, so I'm gonna stick with those. Diameter is more important than uh, height usually, and getting the leads in the right spot. I'm uh I'm kind of brand loyal to Nichicon too. They they just seem to work for me. And every high end piece of equipment that I've used has those in it. I'm talking like instrumentation quality equipment. They either of that or Panasonic or you know one of the other top tier brands. So I I, I stick to what I know is good. And I'm, you know, I know there's a billion different caps out there and, you know, probably 10 or 12 different tier one manufacturers, but this is just the, the brand I go with. They seem to be the best. Depends on what you can get, you know, where you're located.
these guys work for me. And they have almost all the sizes that I need. That's the other thing I like. Like, depending on which series I go with, I can stick to one brand and cover pretty much every replacement that I need for any application. Sometimes they don't have the right voltages, which is annoying, but... I've learned to just step up the voltage if, you know, it's an oddball. I think it was either 2.2 .2 or 22 that I need in, in like a weird voltage, like 25 or something. And none of the other manufacturers seem to make it, so I just, I, that's when I changed to a 50. If the part's not available anymore, like, why? spend extra time and money trying to find the exact replacement when you can find a good enough replacement. And it just ups the voltage, which is actually better for the cap anyways. A lot of these caps are still good, too. Um, I started saving them. I'm just going to uh, throw them up on eBay or something and let some kid that wants to tinker around or something buy them dirt cheap. Or some other hobbyist that's, you know, working on stuff that they don't really care about. I have ton, tons and tons and tons of caps, and a lot of them are still good. I just, I don't know what to do with them. Alright, one more to go. Two more. Oh, I forgot this little guy hiding back here. Two more to go, and then we can start snipping leads. Then we go to the power supply. I think there's six on there. And we gotta hope we have a good transformer. That's uh, still the lingering path of doom on this. I won't get into rebuilding the transformer today. I'll just find another plate that's got a good one and swap it out for now. That's a fairly big commitment to rework that that transformer. You gotta separate all the laminations, clean them really good. It, it, it takes a lot of time. But I promise we will do it eventually. I don't know when. But I still have four or five of these amps to go through, and I know at least two of them have bad transformers on them. And we'll get to it. I'm guessing what happened is somebody had an amp that was blowing fuses, and everybody's initial bright idea is to, well, if it's blowing a 5-amp fuse, let's put a 30-amp fuse in there. That'll make it work. And then... After they do that, everything on the board just disintegrates. And sometimes including the power transformer. Alright. Everything is recapped. Let's clean up our caps. And our mess. And then start snipping leads.
workbench is kind of cleaned off a little bit. Not really, but good enough to keep going here. This is the therapeutic part of the repair is just snipping all these leads off. So most of the work is done and this is uh like the celebration. Try not to snip them too too far down. Leave a little bit of leg on. You don't want to snip into your fillets that you made when you were soldering these in. Just right at the top of the fillet. It definitely helps to have a good pair of cutters. These little these are what CH CHP one seventy Amazon cutters. I think it's a knockoff of the Heiko cutters. Or maybe the Heikos are just a rebranded generic. I don't know. But what I do know is that these things work really freaking good. As long as you don't cut anything other than leads with them. Or wire. If you cut in anything hard, it destroys the blade. But they're not meant for that, so... You know, while you're trimming, give a quick little visual. Make sure you're not shorting any of the pads out. That'll give you some nice surprises if you have a direct short between one of these caps, especially if it's one of the higher voltage ones. Makes a nice spark and a pop that scares the hell out of you. If you see a factory lead that's sticking up too high, you can give that a little whack off there too. Just trim it down. Alright, a few more to go and then it's on to power supply. And I apologize for my head being in there if it is yep blocking the view but I'm just trying to get this thing trimmed off and ready to go move on to the next it's raining outside today so the weather's supposed to be pretty crummy I'm trying to get out of doing any other sort of work today so hopefully I can get caught up in some amps alright these big guys they put this foam tape on I think to protect them I don't know how much protection it gives them I think this is for stability actually to keep them from from shaking um, I like to put a piece of that tape down here on this edge because these are 160 volt power supply lines and they have the potential to rub up against the board that's what I don't like um all right let's uh let's get in here this one is a little difficult to get to some of them just because you have the uh input board in the way and I, I generally don't like to remove those boards and this board can't come out because it's uh, glued in so you got to work around it I am out of alcohol and out of water. I will be right back. I need to fill up my uh my water vial.
gonna need that to change out my soldering tip. I just dunk it in the water and it falls right off. It's beautiful. Uh, what's not beautiful is not having my large tip. I don't like to leave them in the water. I mean, it won't, probably wouldn't hurt them, but I still pull them out. I need my large tip. There it is. Quick and easy way to change tips without losing all your heat. Dunk them in a little bit of water. So we're going to replace the two monsters on here. Hopefully I have them. These are a thousand at 200 volts. And I'm probably not going to have those. Wait, wait a minute. Yes, I do. In limited supply, I have two. I have a bunch of different ones. Like these are thousands of 200, but the obviously they're a little bit too big. Size is, is fairly critical on these, so you got to stick to the original size. So I gotta make a note of that. I gotta order some more of these. Let's just do that right now while we're heating up. Just what everybody wants me to do is order parts on DigiKey. But I don't want to forget. It takes 30 seconds to add them to my cart. You've watched me do the repair for this long, 30 seconds ain't going to hurt you. 1,000 microfarad. 200 volt, and we're going to go with Nichicon. And these are LGU series. Boom. Oh, that's not good. They are out of stock. These are 35 millimeter diameter. All right, that's not good. This worldwide supply shortage is really starting to affect. These are 30 in diameter. The supply shortage is really starting to affect uh, getting parts. It is not good. Let's see what they got in 30. Thirty diameter and what's our height? Might have to go to a different brand. They're thirty-five thirty-five tall. That's the height. So we can do 35 and 37. See what we get. We can go shorter too. They have the short ones in stock, the LGGs. They have See, I, I want to go with 105C, so I'm kind of limited on what I can get here. They are out of stock of LGU, and that's the ones that I like to use. All right, let's check a different brand. Sometimes we got to do that. COVID kind of screwed up all of the parts ordering. 
Here, let's do picture in picture so you're not looking at a blank screen here. Not that that helps you see what I'm looking at, but I made that button and I never use it. Maybe I should start using it more. Um, all right, Chemicon, those are pretty good. They're extremely low stock. Let's see if we can get the size exact. So they're 30, 35 to 37 is factory height. Thirty-five and thirty-seven. See what we get. Cornell makes one. TDK makes one. Chemicon has them. All right, so there's some options out there. I'm gonna get. Uh, I'm gonna get some Cornells. Those are pretty good. Rubicon's out of stock, Nichicon's out of stock, Illinois is out of stock, TDK is out of stock, Vichet is out of stock. I mean, these caps are just getting hard to find. Well, we're going to go with the Cornells. Those are pretty good. Bite the bullet and cry over a ton of those. Not cheap when it's you know five to eight dollars a cap. And what was that other one I needed? Two twenty at thirty five. Yeah, and I needed the UPW series on that one. Two twenty. 35. Helps if you click the right thing here. And again, we will try Nichicon first, and then we will have to branch out to other manufacturers. I'm hoping they have them because I don't want to waste too much time. All right. Diameter on these is 10, and the height is 13, 12 or 13. Lead spacing is 5. That narrows it down. 0 in stock. This sucks. This sucks. All right. We will have to uh, try something else here. I'm uh, putting a PSA out here now. If you're waiting for me to repair an amp for you and it's got some weird parts on it, you might be waiting a while. There is literally nothing I can do when there's a global capacitor shortage. <laughs> I mean, I, my, my hands are tied. Um, Rubicon. Now let's see. Nichicon has UVRs in stock. Those are 85C. Rubicon has Rubicon has some in stock. I'm going to just grab some of those. 7,000 hours at 105 general purpose. Rubicon's pretty good. We'll get 20 of those. I pulled up the data sheet and not the They only have 900 left in stock. Usually they're in the thousands, ten thousands. All right, let us proceed. 
Sorry for that little delay. But sourcing parts is uh is getting more difficult and I don't see it changing at least for, you know, a couple of years while everybody gets caught up on everything. It's kind of nuts. This was a pretty exclusive nerd hobby, you know, like used to have no problem getting parts, but you know, more people are getting into fixing stuff and all these manufacturing giants are sucking up all our parts too. Well, these things can be a pain to get out sometimes. I usually like to double, double desolder them. So I'll suck out all the stuff that's in there, resolder them with uh, leaded solder. And then pull it back out again. We don't need this tape on here. And I don't retape them. I just put a blob of silicone in there, and that seems to work just fine. But you can see that helps them get loose when you do it like that. And these are snap-ins, so you want to make sure you get them loose before you start yanking them out, because you'll tear the through hole right out of the board. Like, look how easy that came out. You know, check that they're dead. They should be. This is not the right way to check that they're dead. Sometimes you get lucky, that one cleared the hole. Alright, big boys are out. There's the old, there's the new. A little bit, a tiny little bit shorter. But this cap weighs like next to nothing. It's very lightweight. This cap is very dense and heavy. So you can tell that it's a, a much higher, just, just by the weight of it, you can tell it's a better cap. Or at least there's more stuff inside. Uh, these four are all the same, so we're going to pull them all out at the same time. I'm not going to change tips for it. But I am going to be careful that I don't melt any of these wires while I'm trying to get in here. Don't melt your high voltage wires. Don't melt your plastic connector either. Sometimes they need a little wiggle to come out. That's all right. Just try your best to tuck the important stuff out of the way. I am going to check all four of these just because I want to see if uh, the reason the owner got rid of this is because it just had power supply home. And Sunfires are kind of unique when they have power supply home. It, uh, it gets worse with the volume level because the power supplies like track the audio signal so when it starts to hum it's usually pretty bad and it gets worse as you turn the volume up let's check these really quick and see if they're if this is our reason A little bit low, not bad. It's 
still not too bad. Maybe there's something else wrong with the sand. That one's a little bit worse. I didn't check all the little ones, so it could it could have been one of the little ones that was. It's still got some capacitance to it. It's not not like a new one. I don't know. We will have to wait and see. These are 470, 35 volts. I'm pretty sure I have some of those. In limited supply. I have three, and I need four. Let's go back and check our our box because that's going to be kind of crappy if I don't have the rest of the parts that I need. Those are thousands. And I haven't worked on, you know, Sunfire stuff in a while, so that's probably why I'm out of stock on a lot of these parts. Check the emergency bin. Sometimes we got a couple in here. should just put these away in my regular bins but I don't like to mix different values together I try to stay consistent with them I don't think I have any at least not in here all right well that sucks I'm gonna see what we got I do have more 470s at 250. I have a whole bag full of them, so that's good. 470 at 16. That's for the MK2. I have a lot of 16 volt jobs, but not. What are these? 35. What I might have to do is just to get it up and running so I don't have to make everybody wait for a version 3 is I'll just put one of the old ones back in. And I know that's like a tragedy, but I don't want to do a part 3 on this. I want to get this thing up and running. I don't think I could fit a 50 in there. I'm really low on caps. That's not good. Bear with me. I'm going to add these to my cart too before I forget because it sucks not having the caps that I need. And again, I'm probably going to be uh, hard pressed to find the correct value in uh, Nichicon. These are uh, UVYs. This guy looks like it's uh, been solder bombed. Four seventy thirty five volts. Diameter is 10. Lead spacing. Yeah, that's a, another important thing, too. Make sure that the lead spacing on the ones you order is right. Otherwise, they sit off the board, and that sucks. Lead spacing is 5.
they don't make this easy to search. None of these websites make it easy to find the cap that you need. All right, I'm going to ignore height for now, and we'll see what we come up with. Nichicon has UVKs in stock, only 300 left. They're 85C, no good. Power supply caps have to be 105C. This is a UVY. Uh, they have 140 of those in stock as they set these guys here. So I'm going to grab 20 of those while I can. And these are 105C rated. And I'm sure in one of my bags or, you know, somewhere on the other side of the room, I do have more of these sitting around somewhere. But let's uh, let's pop them in. And I'm going to put the uh, old one in the easiest place to unsolder, which is the one all the way by the transformer. That should allow me to get the amp put back together, power it on, test it, and I'll just put a little note on there that I need to replace that one cap when uh, the stock comes in. The crazy thing I found, too, is I need to generally pay for either overnight or two-day shipping because if I don't, the large companies that need these parts put in orders for them and since they're spending more money and they have like accounts they get priority over their parts getting pulled so I have ordered parts before and then received an email that says oh hey by the way your parts are on back order which means somebody sucked them out from under me I mean, I get it. It makes sense. Like you want your your big loyal customers to remain big and loyal customers, and little hobbyists. It doesn't really matter, but it still kind of sucks sometimes. And what really sucks is you know, like I generally my customers are usually pretty good. Like they understand that I'm doing this for fun, and. Uh, You know, I, I have limited time, but, I'll, you know, I've had some people getting upset lately. They're like, you know, what's taking so long? Well, one, like, if I'm working on something that's totally destroyed, it's going to take a lot longer. And two, um, it's it's getting harder to find parts. Like, I, I just can't find all of the parts that I need. So, there, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, frustrations built into working on these lately so this guy right here will be the old one it should still work just fine the cap does measure a little bit lower than the others but we just want to get it working once we know it's working then we can worry about Like I can't go the diameter of these things is too close together. I can't go up to the the fifty volts. The fifty volts are just way bigger. I mean I don't know, it doesn't look way bigger on camera, but they they are. They're it's a it's a much larger cat. And I only have five of those, so I have uh, plenty of twenty fives. I wish we could go uh go down in voltage there. I am out of the little guys. Two hundred volt. Yeah, it's just I don't have. It is what it is. We will have to wait a few days and get some new caps. That's all that's to it. So we'll call this a 99.9% .9 recap. I obviously won't sell it this way. I'll wait till I get the uh, 
remainders of the parts in. Well, these are marked. Make sure you observe your polarization. On these, all of the negatives go towards the plate. And they are snapping, so make sure you get them snapped nice and tight. I'm not bothering to clean the silicone off because the silicone that's on there is non-conductive. And if anything, it'll help support the cap a little bit better, especially after I fill this in and put a nice little blob in there to secure it. You know, don't be don't be stingy with the solder. You can blob it in there. I know that's kind of hard to see. Right, let's give it a little light. Someone needs the quality on my audio uh, quality too. Um, I did switch to the isolated USB for this headset. Um, it seems to be better, but I want to verify that it is indeed better for everyone. I know in some of my initial videos I had that really annoying buzzing sound. This guy has that diode on that. Make sure you get that soldered in there good. All right, well, we have our recap. Everything is back in. Everything looks good. We have one old one because we ran out of parts. Let's uh, put this beast back together and see if uh, it'll even power on. I'm hoping it does. Be careful when you're folding your uh, outputs over. You don't want to bend these too many times. If you bend them too many times, you're going to crack the leads. Don't crack the leads, because if you crack these leads, you're, you're toast. So be a little careful. These are a little bit of a pain to get put back in correctly. You really got to keep an eye on that LED that's... Um, that goes into that rubber and get that lined up good and then pop your amp in try not to crush your wires like I just did all right check and make sure no we already made a mistake we're gonna have our thermal insulator in there luckily you can put this in after the amp is seated you just got to make sure it faces the right direction amp popped out anyways all right there we go we're back in so I'm not going to worry about the pots right away um, the three longer screws go to the heat sink bar and the shorter ones hold the amp in place screw the amp in first at least this is how I do it that's a number two Phillips You know, don't crank them all down super tight. Just get them started until you have all of them in there. And do not cross-thread these. Be careful. I think some of these go, yeah, they, they go into nylon, some of them. So you don't need to make them stupid tight. Just tight enough to keep the board from moving around. The ones that go into the brass, you can, you know, give those a little bit of muscle. This one's a nylon, so we're just going to make him a little bit tight. Same with this guy. That nylon strips very, very, very easy. And we don't want to destroy it, so this connector needs a little bit of force. And remember, we have our cap back there that needs to go back in. But you can see why... I put a strip of insulating tape on here. So these wires are just floating and as that subs and they're buzzing around these things are 
you know, doing this in there a little bit. Well, there's uh, solder legs like right here, and there's some of them are sharp. So I usually, instead of putting the tape over the caps, I put a strip of the tape going down this way, and that shields the wires from rubbing up against any of the components. So after I replace that cap, I uh, have some of this 3M sticky tape, and I will put two strips going vertical on the board to keep the wires protected a little better. To me, that seems like the better way to do it. Um, I don't know if it is or isn't, to be honest. I give this power supply line a little twist. Kind of acts as a uh, noise filter a little bit. And then this guy gets folded over like that. So ultra, ultra compact, ultra nice and tight. The last step before we test this is to get the MOSFETs bolted down. These don't need to be super tight either. It's really difficult to get um, these nuts on there. So you kind of got to be careful and you got to make sure you use a number one Phillips. Because they are easy to strip out. I don't know, I dented my razor sharp tweezers. That's no good. I don't know what I was grabbing with them, but. Probably grabbing nuts, which I shouldn't be doing with my good tweezers. But these, y you don't have to hold the nuts to tighten them down. You just need to get the nuts started. Because they have the little star washers on them. And the star washers bite into the device and that keeps it from turning. I mean, if you have to, you can get a pair of pliers on there. You don't want to make them too tight because you'll crack the device. You know, just mo mostly snug. Not He-Man snug. This is kind of a hard area to work in because you you know you have these coils that are in the way. But once you get them started, they go in pretty nice, and they generally self-tighten. I don't know, sometimes. You can put a pair of needle nose on there and just give them a little pinch. But they generally don't need it. Alright, last is our outputs. And I love this design. All of the outputs are clamped with one insulated bar. Get all the screws started first. And then I start in the middle and work my way out. Doesn't really matter, but that's what I'm going to do right now. I don't worry about the pots. And I may pull this board back out too when I get my cap stock back in just to replace this guy that wasn't the right diameter. So I'm not going to go crazy with it. Right, so you don't need you don't need a wrench or pliers or anything on that. That they usually bite right into the so this, Of course, as soon as I tell you that this one doesn't do it. The first one tightened right down though. I didn't need to same with that guy. Alright, let's clean up the bench, put the tools away, and give this thing some power and see what happens. It's testing time. And I think uh, I'll try it first on my cheap little 10 inch test woofer. And then uh, from there, I will go to 
the blown Sunfire Woofer. Don't throw out your little rings, you need these. The little pot rings. Get rid of all this metal. And we have a somewhat clean mat to work off of. Now I am going to first check the fuse. Whoever invented these fuse things, by the way, terrible, th terrible design. I missed the ones that had the knob on them that you could grab. So this is supposed to be a 4 amp. Let's see what they have in it. That's actually a 4 amp. So that's good. That means it wasn't fuse abused. Um, level's going to go down. Crossover's going to go all the way up to bypass. And phase we will put at 0. Just a sanity check. Now I'm not going to plug my speaker in until I give it a quick little um, power supply test. I want to make sure nothing's going to blow up when I f flip the switch. We're going to start current limited, which will probably freak out my light bulb because we got to charge those caps back up. All right, power is off. There we go. Let's flip it on and see if we get red light, which means that's got to go away. Um, leave the board down in case anything blows up. It's not going to shoot in your face. Current limited. Well, bulb went on and off. That means it charges the cap. I have dim light down in the bottom. So that's a good sign. So I'm going to kill it. And the next step is going to be speaker. Now, now you got to be careful. These caps are charged. So you have full rail voltage still floating around in here. And let's observe this. I mean, it's going to deplete after you, uh, after you power down. But it's still going to be a pretty juicy charge left in them caps. 219 volts. Granted, it's going down, but that's no freaking joke. If you pick the amp up, you definitely won't want to, like, grab it right in there, because you will get nailed and it will hurt. So be careful. We're just hooking up speakers. We're hooking them up carefully. These should be insulated. They're not. Shame on me. I heard a little noise in my speaker. But, you know, take some precautions. Don't be stupid. Especially when you're working with uh, high-powered equipment. All right, we're going to go to our inputs. I have it set for 40 hertz. Volume is at zero. And ooh, I have no audio and nasty hum. That is not good. I have 60 hertz line hum. Let's pull out the audio source and see if that's the cause. So I still have line home. So there is something else wrong with this amp. Something else, and it's probably in the power supply section. So this might turn into a lengthy repair now. Now we got to figure out what the heck is wrong with it. It seems like part of the audio signal is floating or the power supply is noisy. Let 
I'm checking to make sure that my caps are all installed properly. That would be the first gotchu. The next gotchu would be a leaking diode. So we're going to have to check the power supplies on this to make sure that all the supplies are playing nice. But the, the first quick look is going to be to check the um, the caps and make sure I didn't make a mistake on any of those. But it's uh, it's a gnarly hum. You know, 60 hertz line hum going right through the outputs. I have no inputs going in there and the volume is all the way down. Could be a bad volume pot. I'll play with that a little bit. It doesn't seem to be a pot issue. So the next issue is going to be checking diodes. And these are the, the kind of things that, you know, make it difficult when you're trying to sort through this. So I'm going to pull up what I have as a schematic. And these are available on the Carver site. I'm not going to post them or put them up. If you want them or need them, go to the Carver site and uh, you should be able to find them there. It's uh, not identical to this... Um, unit but it, it's pretty close it's close enough to where you can do some work on it and figure out what the heck is going on so give me a minute to log into my server here and pull this up So I'm going to start with the power supply and um, see what's going on there. And then I will have to start going through the audio path and see if anything's missing there. I'm, I'm, I'm initially thinking it is something power related. So this... Um, This connector output here is J J6, I believe. Should have plus minus 160 volts. And I, I hope it's not the auxiliary transformer. So the, the schematic that I um, have shows an auxiliary transformer. And that goes to three voltage regulators. Well, this board does not have three voltage regulators on it so it's it's um, definitely a little bit different like they do show the transformer on there but I don't know there's one regulator here but I don't know where the other ones are oh unless those are up here yeah. all right so there are three voltage regulators I'm just an idiot But either way, we gotta we gotta check all the power supplies, and we gotta see which one of them has noise on it. Um, I'm gonna leave it in current limited supply mode, and we're gonna just plug through these. And I'm gonna use my good scope, which you guys will not be able to see, but I will tell everybody what's going on as I'm checking it out. Gotta find a set of scope probes. It's been a while since I busted the scope out on a repair. find where our power supply is failing. My probes are going to be set up for 10x so I can get higher voltages and Alright, 
100, 100 volts per division is what we can get right now. So we need to isolate where the hum's coming from. So I'm going to start with these wires here and um, check the supplies going into the amp board. Uh, this is a supply here. Uh, I don't know which one goes into that connector. I'll have to look again. It's J1. Okay, so J4 is the main supply, 160. That also passes plus or minus 12. And this this one here is plus or minus 13. So let's start with the plus or minus 13, see where we're at on that guy. Just make sure we have both legs of that supply, and then I'll throw them into the scope, make sure they're not noisy. If I see a a 60 hertz buzz, I will know that right away that's where we're having our issue. So let's see, what is ground is pin 2, which is going to be the blue one. Just be careful when you're shoving your leads in there. So I have, I'm missing a leg there. I only have 0.8 volts. And there I only have 4. Let's make sure that the pinout's actually correct. 3.4, 0 0.7. All right, so it looks like we're missing a voltage regulator. Wouldn't that be nice if it was the first one? So I'm going to pull that out and isolate it and test it again. Make sure it's not something on the board that's pulling it down. Um, as soon as I unplugged this, I lost my hum. So <laughs> that's a good sign. I have 31 volts. And minus 30 volts. Well, that shouldn't be plus or minus 30, I don't think. That seems a little odd. Uh, actually, it might be, because the plus or minus 13 does not get regulated until after the device. So, okay, so we, do, we have the plus or minus supply coming in. That's coming out of the transformer. Um, but the the supply sags way down when I plug it into this connector. So maybe we have a bad regulator. This shows that it should be a 7812. This is not a 7812. Actually, it is a 7812. It's just a really old, weird 7812. LM340. No, I don't usually LM is a device number so somewhere in the 13 volt supply I think is where we have our issue I replaced the capacitors on there so we know it's not a cap issue um, we'll have to see what I think this device or the 13 volts powers all of the Op amps? I, I don't know. I'm going to have to look at this. This PDF I'm looking at is super annoying because every time I click on it, it takes me to the Carver website. And it doesn't allow me to pan, which is super, super annoying. So we're looking for where the 13 volts goes on this supply. The op amps appear to be powered by plus or minus 12. Plus or minus 12 seems to be clean because that's still hooked up. The dirty supply is the 13 volt. So where does that go? So 13 volt supplies uh, an LF347 op amp and a TLO72 op amp. And those are uh, 
I think that's part of the muting circuit. Let's see, we have the preamp section that goes to the crossover. So that's right after the crossover. That gets um, fed into an op amp from the crossover. So that's isolated. So the audio side is side is isolated from the uh, amplifier side, so that's why it's so easy to get hum in there if you have noise on that. So it looks like the 13 volt supply is part of our issue. All right, we will dig more into this. I th think we have uh, decent voltage on here. It should be DC. I'm going to check and make sure. I wonder if I could just share my second screen. I need a way to share three screens so I can show everybody what the heck I'm looking at. But this this right here is our problem. When I plug in that 13 volts we have um, erratic hum and the voltage is almost nothing. Alright, power is off. We're still charged at the caps. I don't know which side of the caps, probably this side, the side that I was plugging the speaker into. Yes, I mean we're st we're still at 140 volts, so we gotta we gotta take that down. So I'm gonna drain those. I don't want to be poking in here when it's live, so I'm just taking all the big caps down. The little caps I don't really care about too much, except for this guy. These two, they have they 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 carry some juice, but I can't get to them. So draining everything else should be sufficient. Let's see what's going on with this voltage regulator right here. This guy seems to be part of our issue. Check them for shorts. Not shorted. So it is not the voltage regulator. But something in here is pulling that way down. It could be our op amp down here is bad and you can see there's been some reworks done on this um they added a bunch of diodes in there i hope it's not the op amp but there's an op amp up here too that could be bad I'm going to look some more at the 30 volt supply and uh, see what, um, or the 13 volt. So I have, it comes out of the transformer, I have two smoothing caps, 470 at 35. That's two of these big guys. I also have these diodes up here. Uh, 4004 diodes, there's two of them. If I have a leaking diode, that could be part of the problem. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. This is, uh, 
going to require some investigation. Let's look at the noise coming out of the 13 volts first. And something's pulling it down. That supply should not be sagged that far down. Um, there shouldn't be a ton of noise. on this connector and then after this it should be a fairly clean 13 but when it's plugged in it was I was getting a very low like I almost had no voltage on the positive side or the negative side whatever side this says I had next to no voltage on there so again we're going current limited just to not I have 0.8 volts Point eight volts means something is pulling that down really hard. So it, it could be the regulator. It's weird the way this regulates too. It's it only uses one but you get two rails off of it. I don't quite understand that circuit. It uses a zener diode on the one side. Let's see what we get here. Negative. So the black side is negative. So we got 60 volts across this guy. Dang. Did not realize that. That's kind of high for feeding into... Uh, feeding into this voltage regulator. you think that would get kind of hot. That tells me maybe two of the diodes that are feeding it. So D27 and D28 could be bad. Let's check those next. Drain our caps back down. I'm willing to bet if I pulled this amp board off and just put it onto another amp with a known good um supply area it would probably behave a little better and it, this not necessarily is the fault of or the problem either we got to keep searching so d27 and d28 are conveniently placed right by the wires with some hot glue garbage So I will check both of those diodes. Those are going to be kind of hard to desolder if I have to pull those out. You can't really check a diode in circuit. At least not easily. I'm wondering if it would be easier just to swap the power supply section out and see if I can get it to play nice. At least that would tell me if it's something here or here. Now let's start with the diodes. We'll see if we have short any shorts on the diodes. I know I'm checking them in circuit. That's generally not the way to do it. But that's how I'm going to do it for right now. We're just going to check the check for shorts. Let's put it in the diode mode and see if we can actually get a test on it. So nothing that way. This way we should get some voltage drop. Diode number one seems good. Let's try diode number two. If I can actually get to the leg on there. Without touching anything else. Diode number two also seems good.
All right, we will have to dig into this a little more. I'm going to take five and uh, come back to this. I need to grab a bite to eat, uh, use the bathroom, take a break, and uh, we will have to see if we can figure this out. So this is going to turn into a part three. Uh, it'll be a troubleshooting section, but uh, I'm not going to be gone for hours at a time. I'm just be gone for probably 20 minutes. Let me get some food in me. Let me get a little more coffee in me, and uh, I will be back. So stay tuned for a part three.